My prayer, open our eyes that we may see. Open our eyes that we may see. Don't know about you, but I think too often all I see is what Fox News says is real. What CNN says is real. What, what ABC, NBC, CBS, and all the other alphabet news organizations says is real. Dear brothers and sisters, I submit to you, however, that when we are saved by grace through Jesus Christ, faith in him, that our eyes are opened and we're able to see not simply that which is, but to see what can be, to see what will be. I read an article, I think it was yesterday, by a man who was responding to the threat of the Iranian Ayatollah who says within 25 years Israel will not exist. And this man said, I'm not afraid of that nuclear deal. Because God has the last word on when Israel will, will come to an end. Not some power that hates God. Able to see in fact, there's a sense in which we can see the unseeable, we can know the unknowable, because the Lord comes to inhabit us. We just preach the gospel here. I hope you saw that in the Lord's Supper. The gospel is portrayed in the Lord's Supper. And we remember Jesus Christ, we remember his perfect life. We remember his sacrificial death, offering up himself. We remember him promising that he would rise from the grave three days later, and he did. We remember that he ascended on high with thousands of witnesses watching. We remember these things. We know he is coming again. We, we can see the unseeable. We can know the unknowable. But we have to get our eyes right, <laughs> fixed on the right things. And that's, that's really what this narrative is about. Just mention two things this morning. We'll come back next week, Lord willing, and dig, dig down into it. In this text... In verse 16 and 17, we see, first of all, the, what I call the folly of fear. In verse 16, verse 17, the focus of faith. I fall into the trap, probably you fall into the trap of fearing. We can be full of faith and yet speak our mind, speak righteousness and truth to the public arena, but we should not ever be found speaking righteousness and truth in the public arena out of the fear of what may be, or the fear of what is happening, or the fear of what has happened and what that will mean. Elisha's servant. Folks, you can, you can serve a prophet and still not see the way you ought to see. <laughs> Elisha's servant. Verse 15, he says, Alas, my master, what shall we do? We're often faced with challenges that we need to respond to. What shall we do? But you see, again, what we do must be tied to what we see. And if all we see is, is at the earthly level, if all we see is an army encamped around us, if all we see is a culture increasingly turning against us, even, even confusion within the ranks of Christianity as to what a proper response of a Christian is to be in the public square, when we see those things, we need to remember, and we'll look at this more, in more detail next week, but there's the commendation of the writer to the Hebrew Christians who says, seeing therefore that we're compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, Seeing, therefore, let us run with endurance the race marked before us, marked out for us, literally, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, is now at the right hand of the Father on high. There's a cloud of witnesses, some whom we have known in the years 
even since I've been here, have gone to join the cloud of witnesses. And if we could hear them from heaven, they'd be saying things like, don't give up, press on, it's worth it. Look ahead, look up, see Jesus, it's worth it. It's all worth it. There is this folly of fear. Jesus tells us, don't fear. Stop being afraid. Fear not, for I am with you. It's his promise. There's secondly, the focus of faith. When Elisha had to respond to the young man, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. That would have sounded to that poor trembling servant, that would have sounded like utter nonsense. He's looking around and we're going to say, those who are with us, it's, it's, it's me and thee, Elijah. <laughs> who are those who are with us? And the prophet doesn't chide him. I love this. He doesn't rebuke him. He prays for him within the hearing of the servant. Elisha prayed. He said, Oh God, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha had seen his mentor Elijah carried away in a chariot of fire. We looked at that briefly last week when we saw Moses and Elijah communing with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Elisha knew about chariots of fire. He knew about angelic protection, the promise of God to protect his own. And I would encourage you to read this sixth chapter of 2 Kings. This fascinating story about the axe head floating in the first few verses. There's the story of Benedad. One of my favorite stories in all of scripture in, in the next section where he surrounds the city. But what happens here next is fascinating. God has just opened the eyes of the servant because Elisha says, open his eyes, Lord, he doesn't see what I see. And he opens his eyes and sure enough, the servant sees this angelic army surrounding the enemy had come to crush them. If you read through the rest of the narrative, Elisha cried also, Lord, blind the enemy. And he did. The entire army struck blind and they came to the sound of Elisha and Elisha said something that sounds like it was right out of a Star Wars movie though it was written millennia before that. These are not the fellows you're looking for. This is not the city you want. I will take you to it. And he takes them to Samaria where they find themselves in the middle of the army of Israel. It's a fascinating story. What's the point? I'll drive this home again next week. Brothers and sisters, our enemies are blind. They've been blinded. They, they are as blind as the men of Sodom groping in darkness. They've been blinded by the God of this age with the permission of the true and living God. And what we want to see, we want to pray, dear God, open our eyes so we can see the bigger picture here. I come in here sometimes during the week by myself and just pray. Sometimes I stand here and pray. Sometimes I'm in different places just praying, dear God. Fill this place with people who need to know Jesus. Not so we can talk about seating capacity, but so we can reach people who will come among us and we will increase and expand our sending capacity. I think if we would pray, Lord, what, let us see. I don't, I don't want to just see what I see at Bethel. Let, let us see what you see. Open our eyes to show us what you see. Because I believe if we see that, we'll be encouraged. If we see that, we'll be able to discern 
between that which is important for gospel purposes and that which is not. And I think when we see the love of God for this family of faith, it will help us to love one another more. When we see the longing of God to launch us to the neighborhoods and the nations, we'll be more inclined to move. Someone asked me, I said, well, have these 10 years been what you thought they would be? No, these 10 years have not been what I thought they would be. No. no. But they've been wonderful to travel with you. They've been wonderful to travel with you. To watch you grow. To see you labor. To see you bless others and love others. To be on the receiving end of your love for us. To face challenges together. To weep together as dear ones have departed from us. To rejoice as God has brought new precious babies into our families. To rejoice at victories in prayer, answered prayer, obviously, astoundingly answered prayer. So don't let the enemy of our souls discourage you. So look around you. Look at the culture. Look at this place. Look at that place. Look at this thing. Look at that thing. Look what's not happening here. What's, not, what's happening there? And look by faith beyond that and say, Lord, show me what you see. Show me what you see in me I, so, so that I will change where I need to change. Show me what you see is the need where I need to press in and press upon it and meet it. Show me what you see is ahead for us. Show me, Lord, Elisha prayed, oh Lord, open his eyes that he might see. And whatever you face, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you belong to him, you have the promise of Jesus that I will never leave you nor forsake you, and you have this picture in the Old Testament which is corresponded to in the New Testament in Hebrews that we are surrounded not only by those who are cheering us on, Hebrews 12, we're surrounded by those who will do battle for us, 2 Kings 6. And that greater is he who is in us than he who's in the world. So here's the question. Is Christ in you today? Not simply are you, are you acquainted with Christ. Is Christ in you today? Have you repented of your sins? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ alone as your only hope of being transformed now and completely transformed in heaven? Let's bow. I will just ask each of you silently for a moment to talk to the Lord and ask him to give you eyes to see what he sees.